Hmm. Aha. Join me. Uh, let's go for a drive with one Kevin Astra of Leon in this uh, this Porsche 911 GTR 3R at the Nurburgring. I have been obsessed with this video. Uh, it came out obviously after, not obviously, it came out after this race took place, which was less than a month ago. And yeah, I'm just, I can't get over how impressed I am by, by this driver, by Kevin Astra, by how good he is at what he does. So we're starting here, coming up to the start in 35th place at the start of the 24 hours of the Nürburgring. Kevin Astra won this race as part of a four driver team in 2011, but it's only starting 35th this year, which is not great. But look, already, bam, we've passed two, three, four cars in the first braking zone of the, the first lap. Um, yeah, something I'm going to be talking about a lot, I'm sure, or just repeating a lot, is how impressed I am with Kevin Astro on the brakes, because you will see him make up so much ground on the brakes over his competitors in the braking zones. So yeah, we're on the, uh, on the first lap of this race. 24 hour race we're on the Grand Prix circuit at the uh, at the Nürburgring and in a minute we're going to head out onto the Nordschleife which is what makes this track famous and what makes this race so cool this is also a race I'm a little bit obsessed with it's kind of impossible to watch because it's so long look at that look at him on the brakes Got two overtakes in that one braking zone. He's going to get another one around the outside here. Amazing, just switching back. And we're just gobbling up the cars. Haven't even really gotten started yet, and already we gained so many places. I did have the live timing up here to try and keep track of this, but... I don't think I started at the right time, but that'll be useful at some point anyway. All right, and here we go. Heading out of the Grand Prix circuit and on to the Nordschleife. And now we're not going to be overtaking two, three cars at once in a braking zone anymore. Because now we're on what has I have heard described as sort of the ultimate driving fast on a country lane type racetrack. Uh, and it is like a country lane and it is narrow and you can see that there is one racing line through all this and there are very very few places on the Nordschleife that you can pass and so suddenly we're in this big long snake of cars we've got a Ferrari in front of us now you can see his reflectors flashing in the sun I think and you can see you get a look you get a look at some of the spots but can't make a pass there and look at this I mean just the speed of these flat out sections these long straights there are a lot of long straights on the Nordschleife he makes up he makes up a lot of ground on the brakes he also makes up a lot of ground in the high speed stuff there he got that Ferrari he got half of it done in just the little lifts and the little steering inputs on the very high speed corners and then on the brakes, he gets the rest of it. Let's see where, where we're climbing up to. We're uh, past 27th place already. So start at 35th, we're working our way up. I think my timing screen is behind the actual thing, but we'll figure it out. I guess I should be able to see when they clock through onto the next lap. I have watched most of this before, so definitely will recognize some of these cars that we end up behind for a while but yeah more country lane stuff but it does I mean yeah the beauty of it I think is hard to overstate especially like this it's been rainy the 2020 and 2021 editions of this race were both quite rainy and both had lengthy periods during the night when the race was suspended due, for, due to rain but this one I think had clear running the whole way 
I think they were one lap shy of uh, tying the record for the longest distance at this race. It's a 24 hour race, so obviously the distance completed varies from year to year. But yeah, this one, just like you can see, beautiful blue skies uh, in this beautiful forest. Is it the Eiffel Mountains? I think it's the Eiffel Mountains. Is that right? I could be wrong about which mountain range it's in. But anyway, like it does look like a beautiful country road, right? You can imagine being out driving to some remote place and driving through this kind of landscape, driving past those kind of little houses and driving through these sort of little strips of tarmac uh, amid the trees. Um... But yeah, obviously not as fast as these guys. I mean, the speed here. We're in another one of these long, flat-out sections where just little steering inputs being so smooth. And Kevin is just so, so confident in these sections. He just has complete faith. Not only does he know the track incredibly well, but he's just so confident in his car that it's going to stay put underneath him uh, when, he's, when he's putting in those steering inputs at a very, very high speed. And you can see, I think, some of these other cars are just don't have that confidence. Okay, I think we're behind an Audi now. This is the Audi that we're behind. Wish my time the screen was working well. Maybe it's another Porsche. But still, I mean, the track is so narrow around here, right? Like, he's he's got that one Ferrari early on on the Nordschleife, but still struggling to get past the next guy so not gobbling them up but you see there and there was another sort of breaking area where you saw how much he closed up there is always all, all obviously like a, a concertina effect with this uh, tr train of cars where they're gonna be closer together in the slow stuff and farther apart in the high speeds but I think even even with that Kevin is just always seems to make up distance the brakes going through a real twisty section now it does seem to be I mean it just yeah I know people get obsessed with this track as in terms of like sim racing obsession I feel like that's where a lot of people's obsession with this track comes from um, I'm not a sim racer I never really have been so I've never like had that experience of like oh it's like the ultimate challenge in those games it's just incredibly long track I think I remember, is it one of the Gran Turismo games? There is a game that has this race in it, that has a 24-hour... I mean, I guess nowadays they do the sort of virtual online multi-driver endurance sim racing stuff. But there was a single-player racing game. I want to say it was one of the PlayStation 2 Gran Turismos. Could be making that up. Uh, but it had the 24 hours of the Nurburgring ring in it. You could do that in the game. You could single, single-handedly. Obviously, you can pause the game and put it down and go sleep, uh, and things like that. You don't have to do it in one sitting, but you have to do 24 hours of driving on this track. I remember this because I remember specifically reading a blog post somewhere, or sometime, or a forum post from someone who'd done it and talking about, it, like, yeah, I had, like, a long weekend that I knew I had nothing to do, so I was like, okay, I think I can do this over, like, three days, and talked about, you know, doing, like, eight, eight and a half minute laps and, and taking a pit stop every lap because just to, like, you know, stretch his hands and not be holding the controller anymore. Uh, anyway, all of that is, a, is an aside. Kevin again so good on the brakes look how he's right 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 under his wing now through that braking zone and now we're out into the start of the second lap here this might be an opportunity for me to try and catch up oh no I think my maybe my timing and scoring is pretty accurate actually let's see how many we get on the Grand Prix circuit this time so like yeah just much wider track here which means much easier to get your overtaking done. See the big puffs of dust kicked up when people go off the track ahead of us. I should have looked at OBS to see if I'm actually streaming. It looks like I am.
Oh, I've got my timing. My attempt to use this timing thing. Not working. There we are. I think we're behind Earl Bamber. Yeah, we're behind Earl Bamber in a, in a Porsche. So yeah, we're in. We're in, as it says at the top of the screen, the number one car. Because we're the reigning champion, Kevin Estra. And I, I should know the teammates as well, but... I'm just I'm just obsessed with Kevin at the moment. I'm sure the other three drivers are great too. Um, and yeah, number one because they won it in 2021. And we're in a Porsche 911 GT3 R, which is the exact same car as the car in front. There are quite a few Porsche GT3s in this field. Might be the most represented car. There's a lot of Porsche 911s. There's a lot of BMW M4s. There's a lot of Mercedes GT3s, and there's quite a few Audi R8s. That makes up most of the uh, GT3 field. Seems like there's, you know, the Ferraris and the Lamborghinis are much more rare. Mostly these, yeah, as you might expect, German, German marks at this German race. We're out onto the Nordschleife again. Let's see what we can do about Earl Bamber here. Earl Bamber is also a name that I know, so like through this yeah I was talking about how I got obsessed with this track that's what I was talking about what sidetracked uh, no pun intended but yeah this race 24 hours of the Nürburgring I think I came upon it through some I don't know must have been some motorsports related place that I was already going for motorsports stuff must have mentioned it so I'm like mostly an F1 fan historically right that's the that was my gateway into motorsports like F1 was just a big thing on TV in the 90s uh, in the UK. I remember being stoked that Damon Hill won the world championship. I'm sorry, I don't know if I actually watched the race where that happens, but I remember thinking it was cool that that happens. I remember thinking that Damon Hill and Nigel Mansell were cool. They were British Formula One drivers who had success in the 90s. So that has been like my motorsports thing. And, you know, waxed and waned over the years. I didn't follow it much through college, but then I got back into it you know, a few years after I graduated. Uh, and, yeah, I've sort of sideways gotten my way into other motorsports as I've just saturated myself with Formula One, you know, the thirst. The thirst for new sports always hungers. So once I've got Formula One and I'm consuming all the Formula One that I can, I need more things to fill the gaps. And so, you know, you drift into other, other motorsports, right? You look at, like, you take a look at MotoGP. I think MotoGP is cool, but it's kind of, I don't know that it's for me. I haven't really been, I've watched quite a few races now, and they just haven't captivated me. Uh, which is, I mean, I don't know, that sounds very dismissive. Um, I'm not trying to be dismissive. MotoGP does seem cool. Like, I could totally get how you could be totally in. Whoop, here we are. We're starting to pass people. Okay, this is when this also starts to get wild for a second reason. So not only are we racing all these other GT3 cars, I'm just going to hop back and forth between all these topics that I want to talk about. GT3 cars, right? We're racing a standardized class of cars. Well, not standardized, semi-standardized. There is... A sort of set of uh, there's sort of a set of rough rules that say what a GT3 car is, and you know you got between five and six hundred horsepower I think, and there's some sort of weight band as well, and some rough like how much aerodynamics can you have sort of rules, and they have to be based on a production car in some way. They have you have to be it has to be a car that you're making and selling in large numbers. Um, so that's what we're in, and that's what most of the people are racing in. But these motherfuckers that were going by on the side of the road here, they're not in GT3 cars. They're in other sports cars, other racing cars. They maybe don't have quite as much horsepower, quite as sophisticated aerodynamics, and maybe don't have Kevin Astor behind the wheel. Because at this race, there's like 18, 20, maybe two dozen different classes of cars. There's a field of like 150, 160 cars in the 24 hours of the Nürburgring, it's it's ludicrous. It's one of these events that, like, I don't know, maybe it's not true. People overuse this. It is a cliche, but I do, I am drawn to this idea of, like, oh, you could never do it. You could never do it today. If you propose this idea today, people would say you're stupid. If you propose the idea of doing a 24-hour race on a racetrack that has, like, a eight-minute lap time, with 150 cars 
Um, it just seems silly. And just you can see the difference in performance between the front of the field, which is what we're in. We're in this big train at the front of the field. And we're catching up with cars now from the lower classes, maybe cars that have, struck, have had a spin or an off or a mechanical problem in the first lap. Something like that. Because uh, we're not passing a lot of them yet, but we'll slowly, slowly be passing more of them. And you can just see that they are very, very different cars. And that comes into comes into play it starts to come into play a lot with the overtakes we're going to see some cases where overtakes are going to happen or not happen because of the presence of these other cars in other classes who were lapping and will continue to be lapping for a long way we're still behind Earl Bamber here and stuck behind him for this entire lap so far and just always looking looking but there isn't really a way Esther you know there's no half moves really from Kevin Estra on this on this first stint he's he either goes the whole way and makes the pass or he sees you know he just has a look just has a little look just shows himself in the mirrors maybe says to the guy in front like I could have gone for that um, oh, it's it's also just scary you see he thought about one there right on the brakes he saw that Bamber was like having to break a little bit differently to negotiate some other cars and he saw that window of opportunity you can sort of feel him think about going for it when you watch that's yeah again obsessed with this video and yeah just this this lap traffic stuff or oh, again just sort of had a look at a half move there now we're coming out onto a long straight away again I did sort of load a circuit map up in a tab, but I just, I can't. That's a level I haven't gone to with my obsession with this track. It's actually, oh, you see there's a slow car there, maybe stopped car there. I guess that's maybe been what those flags were for. I mean, the, um, the logistics for this race are just incredible in terms of like the volunteers, the marshals and stuff like that. And like, Oh, he's so quick, and he's like closing, closing this whole time, and on the brakes now. Closing right up, you know, he wants to have a look. Oh, here he goes. That was, wait, that wasn't Bamber. So Bamber must have gone past someone. I must have missed who that was. Bamber's gone past someone. Oh, but we've been balked. We just got balked by a slow-moving car from a lower class, and now someone's gone past us. Oh, that's rough. Oh, it stings. But we're back onto the Grand Prix circuit. So let's see what we can do. Get that guy on the brakes. There's a gap there. Whoa! Just barely. Just barely. I mean, there might have been a kiss. There might have been a kiss there. But we're back behind Earl Bamber again. You know, we had some little, some little dices with some other cars there. Bamber's trying to get forward as well. Look, we're going to go to the other side of that tiny little Fiat or whatever that was. But no, it didn't work out for us. And now we've got some ground to make up. A bit of a gap there, but you see one braking zone and we're right back on. The guy in front. But just always, always catching these slower cars, catching these slower cars. And you just, you know, got to try and find them at the right point we've got a good run out there and we're in this little four car group at the moment we're gonna get right up on the bumper of this Audi oh and the Audi is gonna have a little smack with Earl Bamber as well I know Bamber's gotten ahead of us and we want to we want to stay with him we want to follow follow Bamber through this we don't want to be behind this Audi behind a different different car than the one that we're in Oh, just looking back and forth, bam, down the inside, takes him. And we're back out of the Grand Prix circuit onto the Nordschleife. This is Hatzenbach, I think. Yeah, we have sort of a fairly, like, fast, I guess, opening I mean it's so weird to try and talk about this lap right like it seems impossible you just look at the map of this circuit and you're like where do I begin because it's it's everything everywhere like there's not I guess there is sort of the dotting or hoa into the start finish straight is really just 
a big long straight bit there is a safety chicane more or less in there to make it not quite one big straight but the rest of the lap yeah it's just you know there are some tight wiggly bits and there are some more open bits but you know the open bits have some tight wiggly bits in them and the tight wiggly bits have some open bits in them and it's just everything everywhere That was another Porsche we just went past, right? That was a different class of Porsche, not a GT3R Porsche, some other kind of Porsche that we just bombed past doing twice the speed. You can see the draft starting to come into play here. Bamber's having a look on the Audi in front, and he's moved in quite stick, so can we get him? Or, oh, or, oh, maybe not. Maybe not. Is that Earl Bamber still? Let's take a look here. Yeah, we're still behind Earl Bamber. And there's an Audi in front of Bamber. And I guess it gives you that confidence to go for moves, right? Because you know if your move doesn't work out, you're going to make up in the braking zone. Oh! You can see Bamber, Bamber got balked by that car on the way in to the corner, but then Kevin gets balked by it on the way out of the corner, so it kind of evens out. I'm using balked as though like that is an appropriate term here, but you know what I mean. You sort of come upon the car at one time or another, and you have to sort of decide which way you're going to pass it, right? And sometimes you've committed to being on one side of this car of a car you're trying to overtake or half committed to it and then it turns out that that's the side that they're you know passing a slower car on but yeah it looks like you know we've, we've gone out of this big train right we're in a small train now there's us there's an audi i think there's a uh mercedes amg in front yeah and then we've got a bit of a gap so that's not not great we want to keep up with the leaders. Where are we now? We're in 23rd place. Not a lot of, lot of places to make up. But a lot of work to do, Kevin. Come on. Pick up the pace. What was that? What was, what's that? <laughs> what's the thread that I could pick up of one of the many threads that I've been dangling? There's the, like, the Nordschleife stuff, right? So, I'm into Formula One. Start pushing into other sports. I was talking about, yeah, MotoGP and not loving it, but enjoying it a bit. I have been to Valentino Rossi's hometown in Italy because it's in good cycling country. Um, so, that's I know a bit about Valentino Rossi because of that. So, like, watching his sort of retirement tour was kind of kind of okay, I guess. But yeah, other sort of motorsports that you're likely to find if you're sniffing around on the fringes of F1. You know, there's Formula E. Uh, and then there's, you know, there's a, there's Indy 500. There's like Indianapolis, uh, IndyCar, what am I trying to say? Which also, again, like, I don't know, the way American production covers stuff. Oh, I threw the carousel, bumpy, 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 bumpy. This corner's hilarious. Endurance racing, uh, yeah. What was I talking about? IndyCar. <laughs> IndyCar also haven't been able to get into, and you know, oval racing just, just not for me. But even their street races, I don't know. I'm, I'm trying watching highlights, not getting into it. And then there's endurance racing. Then there's like the 24 hours of Le Mans. And once you get to the 24 hours of Le Mans, then you find out that the, the real shit is like the 24 hours of the Nürburgring. 24 hours of Spa is also pretty cool. That's like the closest... <laughs> that's like the closest a real racetrack <laughs> comes to being the Nordschleife, which is just not a real racetrack. It's just its own thing. It's just the Nordschleife. It's almost... It, it reminds me of sort of like, of like the... Um, the Tour de France versus the Giro d'Italia, right? Like the Tour de France is the big one. It's the, tw you know, the 24 Hours of Le Mans is the big one. It's the big endurance race. If you've heard of one, you've heard of that one. Um, it might make the news uh, a little bit, you know, it might make the back page and catch your attention. But if you're a real fan and you like the real shit and you're not just here for like the big, the biggest 
you know, the biggest budget teams and the fanciest equipment. Or, I mean, that analogy doesn't quite work for cycling, but, you know, in cycling, the Giro d'Italia is just generally, I think, a cooler and more fun race to watch uh, in my my experience as a cycling fan of the Tour de France. And I think that the same can be said of the 24 hours of the Nürburgring and the 24 hours of Le Mans, that this is just like, oh, bang, got him. Got our Bamber there. I think he might try and have a go back at us on this straightaway. You can see we're staying over on the right-hand side. We're giving him space. There he is. He got the side draft. But now we're going to get it back on him. Someone's come from behind us with just mega top speed. Some other car. Not sure which, uh, who that is. Is that the Glickenhaus? I think that's the Glickenhaus that just has like an absurd top end. And has just bombed past us. But we're going to stay ahead of Bamber. Because now we're getting into some of this high speed breaking down to low speed stuff. And yeah. Estra has no problem. Oh, a bit of a moment on the brakes there. Bit of a wiggle, but still clean past Bamber now. Putting clean behind through that, you know, little high speed section with just a lift. And then into the braking zone, getting clean past him. And now we got to get this Glicken house, right? No, it's not a Glicken house. Yes, it is a Glicken house. That's one of the weird cars in this field. It's weird that it's a G Is it a GT3 car? No, it's not. Okay, so that's a car in a different class, even. Glicken house is like a weird... Are they Swiss? I want to say they're Swiss. I could be completely wrong about that. They're a weird, bespoke sort of racing car mark. I don't think they make a road car. If they do make a road car, it's one of those weird... It's like... I mean, not quite like a Bugatti, I guess. What's the... um? It's like a Zonda sort of thing, right? Where, like, it's, they're not at all. It's not a, a, road, a car that you can practically use on the road in any meaningful way. And they look ridiculous. Um, so, yeah, that's, a, that's not even in the same class as us. But it's close. And one of the reasons that maybe it's not in the same class as us is maybe it has a, like, much better top speed than the GT3 that we're riding along with the Kevin Astra. I'm not sure, though. I mean, I do know the Glickman House. With those, like, specialist weirdo sports car marks, like, top speed tends to be a thing they chase, I feel like. So it wouldn't surprise me. I don't understand the class system at all in the 24 Hours of, Nür of Nürburgring. I guess maybe that's one area where the 24 Hours of Le Mans has it beat, is that it's just, like, so much more accessible in terms of, like, okay... There's the, the class that Toyota always wins, there, in which there are two Toyotas and then some other motherfuckers, but who cares? Uh, and then there's the class of cars that look like that, but aren't those cars. And then there's everyone else. And that's 24 Hours of Le Mans. Easy. Uh, Nürburgring, it's like, okay, there's the SP9 is the name of the class that this car in we're, is in. And that's like the top class, but there's also SPX. And there are, like, SPX cars and SP9 cars, like, can both make it into the sort of top qualifying? I mean, I guess anyone could win overall, right? There's no saying you can't. You can win the overall in whatever class you enter in. But, you know, SPX can't win the same class that we're in, right? So, the guy in front of us here... Uh, where are we at? We must be up into the... Low 20s when I went 23rd place. Doing okay. And yeah, much in the Glicken House is in front of us. Uh whoop. Get past that little BMW there. Whoa, not the great not the greatest braking zone there. You could see he sort of that car that uh from a lower class that we passed was just enough to set Kevin's slight, just distraction at slightly the wrong moment, I guess. I don't know. Just wasn't set up exactly right for that braking zone. And he's like, you know, mostly just so inch perfect on like hitting apexes on all of these laps um, that it's like notable to see, see those little things happen, but yeah. So anyway, what was I saying? The guy in front of us, Merch, in the Glicken house, he's in 22nd overall, but he's second in his class. There's only one SPX class ahead of him. So, you know, that guy's doing great. He's happy. 
Um, it seems like, I guess, SP9 is the sort of the class you want to win, I guess, because that's the class where, like, the best the best drivers are in this race. Um, but I really, I don't really know how you feel about being best in class. Although, I mean, I guess you're fucking stoked if you go to the 24 hours of the Nurburgring ring and you win your class, even if your class is, like, six cars. You're going to be stoked about that. Uh... It does, you know, it, the like, I mean, yeah, the, the comparisons with the 24 Hours of Le Mans are, are, are sort of short because they're, this race is just so much more permissive in, in the, num the kind of car that it allows in. There is going to be a big change in the, the car rules for Le Mans in the near future. They've been talking about it for so long. Don't know when it's actually going to happen, but I feel like they've been talking about it for five years. But there's going to be hyper cars. And they're, they're going to allow these cars, they're going to allow GT3 cars into Le Mans, which at the moment, I guess, isn't the case. There is a class for sports cars. This is a sports car. That's, that's what it means to be a sports car, is to be this kind of thing, right? Like, to be a car that's based on a production car, um, but, you know, has been tuned and tweaked and had a big wing put on it and stuff like that. This Glickenhaus, you know, has got some good legs on the straights and has gotten away from us a bit, but I'm going to get him eventually. Um, yeah, that's the sort of what I've always understood as sports car racing as opposed to, I don't know, formula racing, you might call it. So yeah, you see the Glickenhaus just looks, looks kind of ridiculous. <laughs> it looks like a toy car. It looks like a kid's toy car. Bumpy, bumpy, bumpy through the carousel. Oh, and you see that. Audi in front of this guy getting a little bit out of shape there. Who's in that Audi? Beller is in that Audi. Being a sports car means you're some kind of production car based thing that's souped up. You're not a purpose built race car. That's oh, so prototype class, right? That's what they call it in Le Mans. The two top classes are basically, the, the names are complicated, but basically they're, oh, the Glickenhaus had a big moment coming out of that corner on traction. Has a lot of power, but couldn't put it down, and we're going to get him on the switchback, giving him space there. But we're through. Beautiful stuff from Kevin. Now, we've got to get after this Audi and get past this Renault Clio. <laughs> So we can get back to chasing down this fucking GT3 Audi. I mean, it's it's beautiful. So yeah, they'll let you, like, if you can, basically, if you can demonstrate that you've got a pretty realistic chance of finishing this kind of race, they'll let you enter. Um, that seems more or less to be the way the 24 hours of the Nürburgring works. Uh, you know, you can just show up to the, like, there's, there's sort of build-up races, right? There's like, uh, there's a, a series of endurance races at the Nurburgring now, some sort of formalized thing that leads up to this race. Um, and yeah, like if you can rock up to those and complete the distance and, you know, be running flat out-ish, you know, at a good pace for whatever a good pace for your vehicle happens to be, they'll let you, they'll make a class for you if a class doesn't exist already your car doesn't fit into any of the existing rule sets you know obviously there are limits at the top end right like you can't show up with let's say a prototype car from Le Mans um, and say hey let's let's race here because you know you have to make some concessions to the safety at this track Ju you just have to um, and they've sort of settled I guess over time or I don't know it's always a moving point oh this flat out high speed stuff so cool it's so cool. And now, this is, I mean, Kevin's so good at this section. So, so, so good at this, like, hard, hard braking to the chicane down from, from max speed. We're so much closer to this Audi now. We've gone past the Glickenhaus now. It's a uh, Feller and the Share Sport Team Phoenix Audi. The Audi R8 LMS GT3 Evo 2. Car names are very silly especially for cars like these but we're all back on the grand prix track now so surely we're going to find a way past him 
So the Nürburgring N24, 24 hours of the Nürburgring, runs on this combination track sort of a little bit complicated right now we're on we are on as i've said the grand prix track we got the audi easy easy pass on the grand prix circuit for kevin kind of was inevitable you feel like they've got berkman in a mercedes in front of us i think this is the circuit that they're on that uh, they use when formula one comes here you know they run all sorts of races here it's a it's a normal racing track you can see it's got grandstands it's got gravel traps it's big and wide it's got curbs you can use uh it's a racing track um and then there's the nordschleife which is the windy windy country road through the through the hills and the forests and the mountains and the 24 hours of the nurburgring runs on this sort of combination loop of both so you run sort of 95 percent of the grand prix circuit but then you turn left instead of turning right and you go out onto the nordschleife and you know so there are technically lap times for just the Nordschleife, and this lap that we're doing here isn't quite that. There is some, like, thing around, like, the record time on the Nordschleife is, like, a thing. Again, that's, like, I guess, for me, a part of motorsport I have never really been able to get super excited about is, like, the time trial record stuff, like, hill climb stuff, similarly. You know, single lap pace, not that cool to me not as cool as this i mean just like this is just so cool right like this is just like i said i'm a formula one fan and so you know you have to be you have to be not just in it for the racing if you're in for in formula one you've got to be in it for more than that you've got to be in it for it because you're like a geek about the tech stuff or you're like into the like political theater drama side of it or like the personalities of the drivers you've got to be into those things and enjoy those things or formula one isn't for you because they're the racing is just not that good and it's never been that good this is fucking racing like this you know just amazing intense ridiculous dangerous challenging event and these cars that are you know still just terrifyingly fast I mean, just so scary fast, right? Like, I think it's hard. I mean, partly it's just because this is a great camera view. You're sort of low to the ground. But, you know, the gap in, like, perception of speed, I think, for me at least, between this and Formula 1, isn't huge, right? It's not like these cars seem slow when you're watching them race. They still seem fucking fast. So it's not like you're like, I don't know, I feel this argument of that this kind of racing sucks because they're not as fast really holds no water at all i guess i don't know if people actually argue that way but the you know the realities of racing a more modest <laughs> kind of car are that the racing is just better uh more cool close action happens we have a look up the inside of this mercedes here more cool close action more overtaking um, more opportunities for, for heroics. Uh, just... Just can't get enough. I was saying, what was I talking about with limiting the cars to come here? Yeah, like, that's their concession to safety, um, was what I was saying, is because they do an amazing job with the safety of this race. It's like, something I hadn't even commented on yet is the fact that we haven't had any major slow zones yet we've been going we're on our what fifth lap i think now of the race and bear in mind these laps are all you know eight minutes or something like that um it's a long long lap yeah like eight minutes r around eight minutes 20 seconds is what lap times are for these guys so your stint is going to be you know maybe a single digit number of laps in a race like this which is crazy uh, we haven't had any like yellow flag zones there it's this race is so complicated to like organize and understand relative to a normal race there's like so many sectors but then there's so many subsectors that are just marshalling sectors right like the all the marshals posts all the way around the track are numbered and you can there's this very detailed system where they can put in certain speed restrictions in certain isolated parts of the track um, 
because like putting out a safety car is is just like impossible they actually have three safety cars when they do have to put out a safety car when they have to slow everyone down a lot and really like almost but I, it feels like they they'd almost rather red flag than run under a safety car um but yeah the logistics of like dealing with crashes dealing with incidents on this circuit are so intense uh and i think that's part of why they, they sort of have a there's this feeling that you can't really be racing prototype cars that are significantly faster than this kind of gt3 cars around this track because the kind of crashes that you have as as speeds go up the kind of crashes that you can have get scarier um, those cars are also very safe cars just like these cars are very safe cars but uh yeah like th that does seem to be a, just a universal thing it's just more speed means you have not necessarily that you are going to have scarier crashes but the potential of how scary the crash you could have could be goes up and at some point for whatever you know racing situation you're in there's a point where collectively you have to decide okay this is as far as we're going to go we're going to have these gt3 cars you know we'll have our sp9 class we'll have our spx class 2 for things that are close to it but we're not going to have you know nuclear missiles going around this racetrack and people getting into really ridiculous accidents out in the middle of the woods somewhere where it's going to take a long time for anyone to get to them and help them right that's what is the biggest part of or a very big part of safety in modern racing is that you're at this facility and you have a lot of medical support at the facility that you're at at whatever racetrack you're at so that if something does happen you can help people very quickly you're not waiting for someone to drive to them and get them to the hospital uh, and and that's so difficult to do at a circuit that's this big i mean it's very difficult to do even at a place like spa which is sort of twice the length of a normal racetrack whereas this is like six times the length of a normal racetrack out onto i think this is the back straight now like the dotting of her i think we're heading for home for the end of the lap here i think that's the place yeah we're just sort of sitting on our rev limiter here you can hear those like two different notes of like the high note of the turbo and then the lower note of the the engine itself there was a blue flag there so we know there's a slower car up ahead right the blue flag is to tell that slower car that fast cars are coming up it also tells us oh those guys got slowed down a lot in the braking zone there and closed way up to them there's that lower class car we've gone past those and we're into the pits that was it that was one stint we did five laps and now it's time for a pit stop I mean, it just, I mean, it just seems to fly by, right? It seems like we just got started. But no, we got to come. This is time for fuel and tires. <laughs> we can't uh, go anymore. There's Kevin, the man himself, the man, the myth, the legend, Kevin Astra. Um, yeah, as I was saying, I think just one of the, the best drivers in the world. I think you have to say that if you look at, if you look at his driving and you, look at what he does and who he's up against uh yeah just so impressed and he's also i guess uh, he's a specialist at this track um he really is he's he's got so many race miles around this track and so many different cars over so many different years um and that's really sort of a specialty specialist knowledge it's not quite talking about danger and speed and motorsport the isle of man tt right and definitely in that category of events that if you propose now had it not been around for a hundred years no one would let you do it um but the isle of man tt is just so dangerous but also so hyper specialized um the guys that ride the tt you know your moto gp riders obviously are not going to ride the isle of man tt um because they're i guess it's too smart for that uh but there you know there are guys who are good motorbike racers but are not world-class motorbike racers but are going to win the tt or be in the running for win the isle of man tt because they're people who race there and people who know that track which is a similar sort of that is a long windy country road i mean that race 
man, it's hard, right? Like, it's... I feel like I should be at the point where I should just condemn and disavow the Isle of Man TT. Because people do just die every year. Um, and that just seems like... That just seems like it shouldn't happen, right? That just seems like you shouldn't... If people just die every year, you just probably shouldn't do it anymore. Um, but I don't know, there's something still... There's some part of me that is still like... Ah, but... I do, I do still think it's... It's cool. It's like... If it wasn't for the fact that it... <laughs> just murders motorbike riders. It would be very cool. Um, but even though it does murder motorbike riders, I still think it's kind of cool. I don't know if that makes me a bad person or not. I don't know if, if I should just disavow the uh, the entirety of the Isle of Man TT and not watch stuff from it anymore. It was kind of weird, right? Like watching the highlights packages on YouTube and knowing, like watching like the sidecar race and knowing like, oh yeah, like some people died on this one. And obviously in the highlights on YouTube, they're not showing you that. And I guess they probably don't talk about it on the broadcast live, but I don't know. The whole thing. The whole thing is weird. This was a tangent because I was talking about specialization. I was talking about Kevin Estra as a Nürburgring specialist, which he is to some extent. Okay, so we've had our first round of pit stops. So now we're out of this nose to tail stuff. But still going to try and pass some cars. But also now you're going to get to see Kevin sort of out on his own on some fresh rubber and just trying now not trying to race it's what he's been doing this whole time up to this point right that whole first stint was racing every moment of it was racing there was very I mean not quite every moment but there's very little of that that's just I'm out here driving my car as fast as I can around this circuit it was mostly about where are the cars in front of me? Where are the cars behind me? And where do, where do I need to be to like have the best chance of being able to advance in this line of cars? I mean, I can't even. I'm trying to like look on the timing things, find out if we're if we're setting a super fast lap now on our new tires. Um, but we dropped down the order because of the pit stop. There we are. We're in 34th place. And I don't think we're doing insane lap times from... If I'm understanding this thing first, we are insanely faster than these tiny cars that we do. We go past. The size disparity in some of the cars is, is ridiculous. The, um, the BMW M3, the GT3 M3 from BMW is huge. It is a colossal car. It's kind of... I mean, it's impressive that it can make it round corners, like, in the same way that some of these smaller cars can, given how big it is. But, yeah, it looks ridiculous when those um, giant, giant BMW M3s just gobble up these tiny little Renault Clios and Fiats and things like that. I don't know if there are actually Fiats in the race. There probably are. Easy pass this one. They are all overtakes. Oh, so we did. We have set a best sector time. So, yes, maybe the sector like is weird. Just like there's a sector that's like 40 seconds, and then a sector that's a minute, and then a sector that's 10 seconds. Why is there a 10 second sector? This race is weird. This track is weird. Maybe I'm misunderstanding something. I'm probably misunderstanding something. So yeah, it's not just pure lap pace. You know, we're trying to we had a had a little bit of a second go at the steering for that corner, so we're definitely pushing it here. Don't know what the the strategy is. I'm sure that people in front haven't pitted and have stayed out, but you know, you can't like the pit stop variance can't be that big because the laps are so long. I'm sure the others must be coming in soon, so yeah, I'm not sure if 
we're going to make up some positions on the pit stop here, or if we're going to pass some more people on track. See if we can put in any more fast sectors. I mean, it's so hard to just bang in a fast lap when you've got all these other cars from other classes coming around so much slower than you. Beautiful, like, high speed cornering full width of the track right up onto the curbs. And it looks like we're catching someone in the same class as us now. You can sort of see the class difference, you know, you really close up quickly on a car that's not in your class. So, is this the Audi? Yeah, we're catching up on an Audi here. Bumpy, bumpy, bumpy through the carousel. Cold. In the Audi Sport Team car collection. I forgot to talk about the car that we're in. It's called the Grello. We're racing in the Manti Racing Porsche 911. Not all the 911 GT3s. I mentioned at the top that there are multiple 911 GT3Rs in this SP9 class. There are also Porsche 911s that aren't GT3Rs in other classes, um, but not all of them are like entries from some single, you know, Porsche manufacturer team. They're actually, all various different privateer teams. Some of them obviously have manufacturer support, manufacturer money going into them. But yeah, teams. I think most top end teams have got two cars, but not all of them do. Um, and we're in the Manti Racing one, which is called the Grello, because you can't really see it here, but it's bright, fluorescent green and yellow. Very bright, uh, very arresting. I saw Kevin on an interview chatting about, you know, he, he knows that when he's coming up behind a driver that they see him coming, because he's driving this incredibly striking car, but you're going to notice it in your mirrors. All right, so I can, um, the timing screen is going nuts with all the people in front of us going into the pit, so we'll see how that goes at the end of the lap. Pit stops, I think there's a mandatory minimum pit stop time. It's another safety thing that they do here. Um, it's an interesting sort of thing. Came up in some other, it came up in Formula E early on as well, didn't it? There's a minimum pit stop time because you might have driver changes. And if you have driver changes, what you don't want is people trying to make the driver change as quickly as they absolutely possibly can because then they're not going to get their straps done. This is this is the theory behind the minimum pit stop time as far as I'm aware. Um, I guess it's a bit also just for balance of performance reasons. All right, we're back on the Dottinger Hurra now. We're heading for home and we're going to be presumably having people coming out of the pits around us, maybe in front of us, maybe behind us. We might make up some places here. Uh, yeah, the minimum pit stop time is also just, you know, to try to not have this money sink where you can just put money in and get time out. That's sort of the kind of thing that they try to avoid in a lot of motorsports, a lot of sports in general. Whoa, that's so scary how slow that guy was going. We just come all the way past him. Uh, I mean, I don't know. He must have seen him coming and he must have been off the racing line, but oh, terrifying. Uh, again, on that high braking on the, the back straight, the, I don't know why I call it the back straight, but it's this sort of extended straight with a kink in the middle. Kevin's so good there. And I think we might have a, have a go at this Audi on the Grand Prix circuit, don't you? I think we should try. Okay, I think we've made up some places, we're up to 20th. Oh yeah, we are going to have a go. I said we were going to have a go and then I looked over at the timing screen and he was gone. Kevin was past him. That's up to 19th. And again, I'm not sure how many of the people in front of past have, uh, have pitted or not. Catching up with this fucking VW. Oh, I thought it was a Renault Clio, but it's like that VW's got some big aero skirts on the back of it. That's hilarious. I was talking about minimum pit stop time. Yeah, they want they want you to do up the straps. They really want you to do up the straps. It makes a big difference. It's one of the big, important safety things for high speed racing. All sorts of high speed stuff, basically racing cars, anything, jet planes. It's going to go very fast. You want to be strapped the fuck in, real tight, real tight, as tight as you can, uh, as tight as you can bear it. 
Um, t a little bit tighter than that. Uh, that is what you want. Um, and you want that as a driver because it means you don't bounce around. It makes it easier to drive the car. But you also want that if you're concerned with not having people die at your motor racing event. So that's why they have minimum pit stop times. Or one of the big reasons. We're in 20th place overall, in 19th place in class. It's like ahead of us. It's Kelvin van der Linde. That's also a name. Or one of the van der Lindes. Wait, there's two van der Lindes. These are so... I'm, yeah, I follow this race erratically, right? Get into it in the side through... Uh, Le Mans. And then you find out about this. And then, you know, it's only once a year, right? And then you might miss it one year. Um, and you can't really, like, sit down and watch it. It's like... I sort of, I don't know, try and check in if I think to, if I find out that it's on, but it's not really, even then, like, you don't really want to sit down and, like, turn on the 24 hours of the Nürburgring on, like, hour 16 and be like, right, I'm going to sit down and watch this for, you know, the next hour, hour and a half. It just, I don't know, I can't imagine doing that. It seems weird, but it, I do love to, you know, oh free wide um i do love to you know find out what's happened read about it after the race watch clips watch highlights watch videos like this uh and get some sort of feeling for what the race was like um and so yeah year on year names that you start to pick up kevin astra obviously one of those names that has stuck with me but yeah the van der Lindes. i want to say there's two of them i think they're brothers one of them's called kelvin van der Linde. Another, the other one is called something else. But that's who's in front of us. But yeah, I'm curious. I feel like that probably most people have pitted. No, it looks like there are some people. Maybe the Mercedes is. Maybe there are three Mercedes. Maybe the Mercedes can do better fuel efficiency. So we might get some Mercedeses for free on the pit stops as well. So this sort of section is trickier for catching these cars, these sort of medium speed corners where there's only one line. You can very easily, you know, if you catch one of these in a high speed straight, you're probably going to get past them easily because you've got much higher speed. See the little indication there of him saying, car in front saying, I'm going to keep left. Is that Aston Martin maybe? Um, I am very impressed by all the drivers in this. That was another thing that I was really thinking about was... You know, yes, they'll let you race in anything, but um, the people who do this are people who, even in the lower categories, you know, they're maybe not the, like, quickest racing drivers in the world, but they all, like, know their stuff as far as how to make this race work. You can't run this race and have people out there being idiots. You have to... Everyone has to know what the deal is with, you know, this multi-class racing with these huge closing speeds. Um, if your guys in your lower categories don't know what the fuck they're doing, uh, it won't matter how good the guys in the higher categories are. Um, so, yeah, it's so impressive that all of these, you know, most I feel like a lot of these people are like weekend warriors, right? Not professional racing teams at all. Maybe I'm wrong about that. Maybe that's patronizing. But yeah, weekend warriors are out here and they are, you know, doing all the right things at the right times, for the most part, to stay out of the way, bumpy, bumpy, bumpy around the carousel, of these huge GT3 monsters bearing down on them. Are we going to get a yellow flag here? I thought I saw one. Already. No. Yeah, we've had just, like... Like I said, it's like uninterrupted running. You know, there have been some incidents. We've seen some stopped cars or some slow-moving cars. Um, but we haven't hit any slow zones, I don't think, unless I've missed one. That was something I was mentioning with the safety stuff. I said they don't do safety cars here. They do these slow zones, right? It's like code 120 and code 60, I think is what they say. Like That's kilometers per hour, so this is a European race. So that means they can have a maximum a minimum yeah a maximum speed zone of either 120 or 60 kilometers per hour for 
certain sections and I think if they have a 60 then the section before it automatically becomes a 120 stuff like that good ways of localizing uh, safety measures on this very big track in order to try to be safe but also deal with it as well but also try to keep the race going like a race like this it's so hard to stop and start a race <laughs> on a track this long i mean that's you know everything is harder on this track but that specific like they said the parade lap the lap to the grid takes like 20 minutes right everyone gets in their cars at the start of the race they drive around the whole thing in one huge train of 160 cars and it takes them so long. Okay, I was wrong about the, the stint length. There's people looks like can do seven or eight laps. Eight laps, I guess, maybe. Maybe we're gonna catch way more people on the pits just because we're out here putting in mad laps, being Kevin Astra, just whipping past these uh these marshal posts. It's fun to look out for them by the side of the road. so impressed by the marshals right like all volunteers um and man it makes you feel like this race there's something about the fact that you know that people aren't in it from for the money right like you know if if the money wasn't in f1 no one would be doing that but you feel like if the money there isn't there isn't money in this right like if there is money in this there's not very much these guys are getting rich off this uh I hope they're getting paid well, but I don't think they're getting rich off this. Um, the sponsorship money is not huge, but people do it because they love it. People do it because they love this track and this, like, nuts race. And there's something cool about that and see how many places we're going to get on passing people in the pits here. I don't think we're going to be up to first, but we might be close. Wow, so doing sort of early pit stop really clearly a strategic benefit for us I mean, also fast lap times are obviously pretty useful but yeah it seems like strategically that's worked out well what was i talking about completely lost what train of thought i was on I was talking about the love of it. Yeah, I mean, I yeah. Again, I'm trying not trying to be patronizing, and it is a cliche, but I do think that this this event in particular, and there that doesn't mean there aren't other events like this, but I guess maybe I should say events like this happen because of the love for them that people have for them, and because of the passion that people have for them, and not because they're getting paid hundreds of thousands or millions of pounds or dollars or euros to do it um and then you know in a way it's like also makes me think like motorsport is going to survive in some ways even if the the petrol car goes away the internal combustion engine goes away um because people are there's these shit like this right like this is this institution is going to to persist because it's encompassed so many people and been around for so long right like it's gonna be hard to get rid of it all right i think we're up to third place now oh and i think we're in a slow zone maybe no we were just really strong that guy just man Yeah, I'm not sure if that was a slow zone or if we just really were having a hard time getting past that slow car. Yeah, timing screen is a little confusing, but I think we're in third place. I think Nikki team in the Aston Martin is in front of us. Oh, there's also, yeah, Kellen Van der Linde and Nikki team. I think are the two drivers in front of us. Let's see if we can get them. Let's see how far away they are and get past this guy. Dustin. Oh, I love these high-speed bits. And on the brakes. Ah, oh, beautiful. Hooks up the apex. I mean, it's just... It's poetry. 
I can't get enough of it. I can't. He's just so good. There's a similar video to this from last year of his first stint where I think he goes from 11th to 1st. But, um, yeah, this one, 35th, was the starting position. So, even more impressive. I also... I want to say, I couldn't find this video, but there's a video I remember, I think from two years ago, from one of the very rainy events. I saw a video of one of Kevin Astra's, I think it was Kevin Astra. My memory of this is so fuzzy, I wish I could find this video again. Have another look. But it's of a, one of the night uh, stints. And definitely this car, it's the Manti Racing car. Uh, and it's a pass on the track for the lead of the race in the middle of the night, in the pouring rain. Uh, it's such an intense video, and it's, again, something that just made me have so much respect for the skills of these these drivers that do this race. Um, and yeah, just the ability to, and the knowledge of the track to be able to race so closely to someone in the middle of the night, in the dark, in the pouring rain. Um, just intense, just nuts. Okay, we got some yellow flags now. Now, for real, we are in a slow zone. I think this is really the first one that we've come across. It does play into the strategy. There is some, you know, math around, like, if your arrival is in the pit while you happen to be on a lap that goes through a slow zone, then something, something. Who are we picking up? Not sure. But that'll be gone by the time we get around next time, right? Like, these guys are so... These marshals are so good. They have the, like... Ability to clear cars quickly is so good. And the lap is so long. <laughs> but they'll have, you know, 10 minutes. I mean, it's still impressive they get a car out of there in 10 minutes, I guess. But let's get going again. See if we can catch that van der Linde and that team... on these beautiful roads. Closing speed, massive. Oh. And now these guys are side by side in front of us, which is a pain in the ass. They're probably in two different classes as well. Catching two different cars in two different classes at the same time. Still nails the apex into that hard braking zone. I mean, I thought I might try and, like, look at the lap chart. I did think, okay, I was like, I think the carousel is coming up. And, lo and behold, the carousel is coming up. But I'm going to open up this, uh, this map here and see if I can actually try and follow us a little bit. Catching up with this Clio. Yeah, I, I, like, I'm already lost. I was, like, trying to look at the map. I'm already lost. I think... I mean, it's just, like, everything is just... Your sense of scale is just so off. Everything is so much longer. Are we going... Is that... Was that... Brunchen? Are we coming up to Flansgarten? I don't know. Here's, like, I don't... I don't know. I don't know where we are. This track is so... People, the people who know this track are so... I don't know, it's like it's like learn, lear, learning the quarter names for the Norschleife is like learning the fucking... learning Elvish or learning Klingon. You know, it's like... It's a level of fandom that I don't necessarily aspire to. And I'm kind of impressed by it, but also... Not that impressed. So we're in some fast bits now. Are we out onto the Dottinger Hoa yet? No, I don't think we are. Catching up to a whole gaggle. Ooh. One guy saw us, the other guy didn't. There we got him. Was that Schwalden Schwanz? And now we go out onto the Dottinger Hoa? That indicates. Ooh. Did we hit that guy? There's some sort of clunk there. I did know, I do think that the um, audio is ever so slightly out 
of sync with this video. Not that that matters that much, but you could, I guess, it would be like listening for listening from on the brakes. Um, but I feel like I can tell when he runs over curbs and stuff, the sound seems to come a little bit early. We are now definitely out onto the big long straight, so it's like there's Dr. Gahoa and then there's Tiergarten, which I guess is where like the break for this chicane, you see that TV helicopter above us there. Yeah, we have not caught Vanderlinde or team yet, and I don't think they're pitting, so I think they're on the same, they're on cycle with us now. Break for this chicane. Whoa. I feel like this must have originally just been one big massive straight, and at some point they put the chicane in to make it safer, like they did on the, the Mulsanne at Le Mans, but I don't know that that's true. And on to the Grand Prix circuit. Cars in lower classes coming out of the pits, getting in our way. Oh, oh, just had to carefully, carefully put the throttle on there. Didn't want to understeer <laughs> into that BMW. I was talking about, you know, the passion for this event, right? And what I was thinking as I was saying that was about the Isle of Man TT again, right? And thinking about, like, that's also a thing where people aren't getting rich off that. Um, people aren't in it for the money. Um, they're in it because they, they love it and they're passionate about it. I guess you could say people are in it for the fame and maybe that's like a negative ooh, I get that guy on the bricks um negative in the same way as be in a similar way to you know being in it for money right like if we're creating a society where you've got to you know aspire to some sort of notoriety so you're gonna go into motorcycle racing on the Isle of Man I don't know if that's coherent at all but yeah that race keeps happening even though it murders people because people care about it a lot and really want to keep doing it and I guess the same goes yeah I was gonna try like also parallel I mean it's not really parallel because it's people versus horses but the Grand National is not that's one maybe because it's horses not people it's harder to justify keeping doing it even though it murders participants I don't know the Grand National just yeah I mean the, the Kentucky Derby I guess probably also kills horses but not as many Kentucky Derby just seems to be all have lots of scandals about doping at the moment. That's all I ever see that shit in the headlines for. So yeah, it's interesting to think about these events, right? These like institutions, you know, the Isle of Man TT, the 24 hours of the murder thing, Pikes Peak Hill Climb, stuff like that, that are like these weird community driven events that are sort of trying to keep themselves safe enough that no one gets too bad at them, I guess? I don't know. I thought, I thought we would have caught Vander Linder by now. And where he pulled out such a big gap. I mean, I guess the field spread early on, maybe, while we were caught behind people. Caught behind this guy now. we got to get out of the way. There we go. So, you see, that guy was, like, not too much of a slouch out of the corners compared to us. So even though lower class cars, you know, different ones are going to be like, have different performance characteristics in different parts of the track and in different track conditions. So you've got to be aware of all of those things when you're trying to pass one. And that's nuts. I don't think he'd know the drivers. Like he knows... And I was watching some interviews with him saying, you know, he knows, like, the other drivers in his class, more or less, knows most of them, so... It, and knows them in the sense of, like, 
has an understanding of what they're, how they will race and what they will do in certain situations. Um, I'm guessing probably doesn't have that for all of these, you know, all 158 cars in the field. Some of those are just cars. But I wonder if you like... I don't know, there must be cars you never see, right? There's probably, I don't know, probably see every car at least once. Probably pass every car on track at least once over the course of this race. But I wonder, yeah, if you're a driver, you're just by the end of the race, you're like, that one fucking Clio, I swear I saw that Clio every lap. I don't know how it was there, but it was there every lap. Or if you just, like, don't even notice that at all. High speed stuff here, catching up with two Audis, I think, in a lower class. Get past both of them. A little bit uncertain on the throttle there, but I mean, so ah, oh, so committed. And on the brakes, tricky braking zone. Got to change direction mid braking zone, but just perfect, just perfect. Bumpy, 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 bumpy. I keep, you know, I keep looking ahead and being like, is that the BMW that we're chasing? Is that the BMW that we're chasing? Could this one now in front of us be the BMW that we're chasing? I'm not certain. I think it might be, you know. We're not closing down on him that quickly. Seems realistic that that could be someone from our class. Let's see what we can do here. And it looks pretty it looks it looks pretty big. Is that our big boy? Whoa. Picture break up. The bug annihilation on this screen is something nuts as well. I mean maybe not all all bugs, it could just be mutter stuff. Oh my god, there's just fucking what the fuck? What the fuck? I'm sorry. We have to go we have to scrub back a tiny bit. Where are we? I can't believe it. Did I not go back far enough? No, I did go. But look at this! One yellow flag waved, and we're just like, oh, there's a guy with lights. There's a fucking flatbed with a crane with a car on it. We're still racing. It's fine. Didn't need a code 60 for that, I guess. I mean... Outrageous. Okay, so... Van der Linde got really stuck behind two cars there coming out of that weird overtake of the flatbed truck and that's closed us right up onto the back bumper of the big fat BMW. wonder if you get like an extra good draft behind it because of account of how big it is. I also wonder how far in front Mr. Nicky Team might be. Oh he's close. I think he's close. Okay, I'm trying to actually learn to read this timing screen also, which is uh, a trip. At the same time as I'm trying to learn the corner names on the North Life, I'm not, I'm not trying to learn. I know the carousel, and I know, I think I know the Uh and I know the Grand Prix circuit, that's not a corner though. All right. Let's, can we get this BMW? Can we see the Aston? No, I don't think we can. Interesting, he's trying to draft off this other car and maybe just stay in a straight line for as long as possible. No, oh, it looks like we're closing a little bit. Looks like we're clo Oh yeah, we're closing a lot through the corner there. And now, we're gonna close up a lot more through this. Whoa, oh. Had a bit of a wobble there, but yeah, excellent. Braking as always, and we have closed up a little bit. Not as much as we'd have liked. Let's see, can we get the Beamer on the Grand Prix circuit? I mean, we've done so much good passing there. Feels like it ought to be possible. Again, these like lower category cars coming out of the pits. Oh, he's gone wide. Going for the cut back. Oh, yes. Excellent traction. Is he going to come back at us? No, Astra's got the inside. Beautiful. Up to second place. 
started from 35th. And this could be this could be first place in front of us. No, I think first place is six seconds in front of us. I don't know, that looks kinda Aston Martinish. No. I think we've got some time to close up on Mickey team in the Aston Martin Bank Vantage AM something something something. Whatever it's called, it's too long to fit on this timing screen. That is that a Ferrari? Thing look ridiculous. Maybe that's another glitch. No, it's not a glitch. No, I don't know what that was. I did have a spotter's guide as well, but I wasn't. I'm not going to try and figure out what these lower level cars are. Interesting though it is. I mean, it is fascinating to see all the different kinds of cars that enter. Oh, lots of curb there. I'm not sure that was the best couple of corners but back out onto the Norschleife again and let's try and set off after this Aston Martin so I always have some back is this so we have these Hockenheim is this I think this is Hockenheim or a Hochheichen maybe Hochheichen is that Is that what this is? <laughs> that be ridiculous trying to say these things. And then we have the Kittelbacher Hoa, which is this. And then we go up to Flugplatz, which is this. Whoa, I heard the wheels. Man, that was scary. And then this is Schwedenkreuz. And then Aremberg should be this big, tight turn at the end of this straight. That's what I think to be the case. Lovely. High speed braking down to low speed. For a beautiful corner. Oh man, the uh, Aston's pulling away from us though. If I'm reading this right, or if it's accurate. Whoop. Get past that guy. Oh, I was trying to look at the maps and I've lost it now. Yeah, look away for one second. I mean, I mean, obviously also not all the corners are on the map because like there's too many. I don't know how if all of these, if every kink has a name, every it, it must, right? Like the nerds, the Nordschleife nerds would not allow anything less than every inch of this track having some kind of name or reputation to it, I'm sure. Back to the time, man, we got a long way. Long way to go to chase down this Aston. I don't know if he makes a mistake or has a problem at some point. I feel like I've seen this car before. It's hard to tell though, right? Like, because like, there might be multiple cars from the same manufacturer, or the same, not the same manufacturer. Well, yes, there are multiple cars from the same manufacturer, but they could also be entered by the same team, so they might have similar livery. <laughs> Random flashings of lights there from that car as we go past. Oh, okay. Starting to close in on the Aston Martin now. I mean, time gaps are so tricky with all the traffic, right? But you're going to be... You're not going to get any clean laps without having to negotiate something. Oh, so good. You can really see the difference in grip he had ahead of that guy in front who could do so much more in that high speed corner. Whoa, I never... Doesn't seem to love the braking for that guy. I feel like doesn't seem to love it. It's maybe the one spot on the track where I feel like he consistently is like, oh, 
Feels like he maybe was just slightly later. He could have been. I don't know. Maybe I'm misreading. Maybe he knows exactly what he's doing. He probably does. Is this how I act? How I, I don't. I don't understand. It's like I see three. Oh my god! Get past that, dude. I see three corners on the map, but I don't know if it's like these three corners or if it's three corners on a much larger scale. Of like, if you're very zoomed out from the track, it looks like it has these three corners, but when you're actually on it, those three corners are eighteen corners. It's hopeless. I'm trying to come up with some larger structural point about institutions and institutions focused around events. I don't know. Glastonbury is also happening right now, right? Like, that's another one of those things, you know. I don't think anyone makes a ton of money off of Glastonbury, really. Um, certainly, I know that, like, the guy who runs it lives lives pretty modestly right like he's not made himself super rich but whoa couldn't see a fucking thing there there could have been a car there there was a car on the other side of the track there i mean so scary but yeah glasto also maybe seems <laughs> post pandemic definitely seems dangerous and irresponsible and like it will murder people in a way that it didn't before so that's cool uh, oh, we've, we've got him. We've got the Aston somewhere. Where was he? I, I missed it? Or was he the one that was off to the side? Or is this him in front of us that we're about to get? And my timing has now overtaken the video? I thought my timing screen was behind the video, but maybe it's... I think we're about to get this guy then. I think this in front of us is... Nikki team for the lead. No, it can't be. You must. Yeah. Yes. Also, Kelvin van der Linde is right behind us. Is this Nikki team in an Aston Martin? I think it is. You know. And I think we're gonna get him for the lead of the 24 hours of the Nurburgring on our first stint. Kevin Astra. What a legend. 35th place. To first place in a stint and a half of the coolest, hippest endurance race in the world. Um, just incredible. Just an incredible driver, an incredible track, an incredible event. Uh, can't. I just can't stop being impressed by this. Uh, and how good, how good of a driver Kevin Esther is and how much fun it is to watch him. Yeah, it's marvelous.